All right. I have fired up the camera about seven minutes early, just so that everybody can get advanced notification to come on in. If I can edit this video afterwards and either trim this out or put in a timestamp when the actual video starts, I'll do that. But for right now, what I'm going to do is quick send out a notice uh, to let everybody know that we're live. So just bear with me here. You get to see a little the behind the scenes of me prepping for this. Actually, it looks like, um, so hang on for a second. Let me get the chat window squared away. Good morning, everybody. Wow. So apparently people were prepared for this. I've already got more people in here than uh, I typically do on the serious keto live streams. So I'll be able to just kind of chit chat with all of you initially. Once we hit the uh, the actual start time, then I'm not going to be able to greet everybody that comes in. The plan was that Courtney was going to help me, <laughs> but she's still sleeping. Apparently, she's catching up on the sleep she lost out on while she was in the army. So, hello, everybody that's joining so far. Uh, Jason asks, how's the mood there after the Bucks' big win? Well, actually, the parade is this morning. I had mentioned this on the uh, members live stream that I did on Sirius Keto that because Connor, his um, his National Guard unit is part of the riot response team. So the city of Milwaukee called up his National Guard unit uh, because I don't know if anybody saw it, but there was 65,000 fans outside of the Pfizer forum watching the game on a big screen and just far too many people if something happened for you know the local police to control. So National Guard was called in. Fortunately, uh, nothing happened. Uh, Connor basically was like a traffic cop, but he's now then uh, helping out with the parade today. And he's been away for the last now two and a half days. He'll be back hopefully in time for dinner tonight. So uh, I have been working you know, I'm just going to, like I said, just sort of fill some time here till we actually hit the official start time of 10 a.m. But I've been collecting some footage for various videos that I plan on doing, you know, uh, household hacks, things like that. Um, I will see how well they turn out. The challenge, you know, for this channel, similar, similarly to Serious Keto, is I'm a one-man show, which means filming oftentimes involves either trying to set up cameras in advance and taking multiple shots, or I actually got this, I don't have it with me, but it's this sort of bendable, thick wire harness thing that then, you know, I can mount my phone on right in front of me and get sort of a, a POV sort of shot on whatever I'm doing. The problem is, I, like if I'm washing something in the, in the sink, I want to be looking at what I'm doing rather than looking through a, a camera at what I'm doing. And I will have to see once I pull that footage into the editor, how well everything lines up. So uh, because I don't have Courtney here kind of feeding me questions, there will be periods where there's little pauses where I look at the, the chat window. And also, you know, I, I, apologize in advance that I won't be able to recognize everybody and everybody's questions as they come in. It'll be sort of a randomly picking out questions as I see them. And what I may do, what I'll probably actually do is find somebody, perhaps amongst all of you, who's willing to be a moderator and help me out with the comments. And who knows, maybe then that means I put uh, I put in you know my ear AirPods and we have a phone call going on live so that you can feed me the questions. We'll see. I'm not looking for volunteers right now, though. So, oh, Patricia in Brown Deer. I was just up in Brown Deer last week at North Shore Audi. Not for me, but we had to get a new car for Connor since he crashed his car trying to avoid a deer. And he got an 
absolute steal. I'm I'm in, I'm amazingly jealous because I'm still driving a 2008 Honda Accord. He had a it's a 2013 Toyota Camry like XLE, whatever the top of the line is, the leather interior and the Bluetooth and navigation and all kinds of stuff that I don't have in my car. And it belonged to a couple in their 80s. And the only thing they used the car for was driving to their mailbox. Their mailbox was about a mile away. So even though this was a 2013, it only had 15,000 miles on it. The car is just mint. And uh, Connor... Connor managed to find it on the internet and, and snag it. And so we were up in Brown Deer. So I should have waved Patricia while I was driving by, like honked the horn and waved. So uh, let's see here. We're about one minute away from really getting rocking here. I'm going to actually see if I'm going to pop out the chat window and how can I? Put it up near the top of the screen. That way, at least, maybe as, as I'm reading questions, it looks more a little closer to like I'm looking at you. Because I do have a, a kind of a large screen here. I use it, you know, for video editing. And plus, just as I've gotten older, my vision, not so great. So everything bigger. And uh, But that means if I'm looking at the chat window, which is over here, I'm totally not looking at the camera. And I want to feel like uh, I'm looking at the camera. All right, pretty much now we're ready to start. Um, not sure if there's any other uh, housekeeping to get out of the way before we get going, but just a, a remind. Well, I'll wait one more minute for a few more people to show up. <clears throat> um, what else? Got my backdrop, you know, going on here, so you're not uh, distracted by a bunch of Star Wars pop Funko figures. Though I've got a few on my desk here. Here's a. Uh, uh, I guess what a lethargic Thor or uh, apathetic Thor from uh, whatever the fourth Avengers movie was. And uh, oh, I can't remember his name from office space. What was this guy's name? Somebody tell me from office space. You know, I'll just knock one of my notes down on the floor here. So interestingly, on the vision thing, when I was kind of right on the edge of breaking keto, and some people have argued that since my ketones, my blood ketones went below five, uh, you know, I wasn't in nutritional ketosis anymore. But the weird thing is, when I had that little carb binge for a few days, I didn't need reading glasses. That was kind of weird. I don't know if it's coincidental or correlated or something, but, uh, my, my near vision got better. And I'm, I was, I was kind of amazed Lumberg. Thank you, Tam. All right. So, uh, I'm going to first tell you just a brief little story. And, uh, if, as you have questions, this is sort of, uh, an ask me anything sort of situation, anything that was is sort of related to lean body mind. So, personal improvement, deficiency, or, you know, things about my past, my career, et cetera. So right now I am reading this book and I don't know if, are you guys, does this, is this reading properly for you or is it the mirror image? Somebody let me know. Uh, I don't know if I can fix that within, uh, within YouTube, but lights out pride, Delusion and the Fall of General Electric. And this is, an, uh, I, I'm kind of tearing through this book at a pretty good pace compared to usual. I'm, I'm sort of a slow reader. Uh, I, uh, I tend to almost narrate in my brain as I'm reading. So I'm not a super fast reader. I like to kind of savor what the author has to say. I love, I love the English language and you know, if somebody is is writing well, I really like to kind of take my time and absorb that rather than just fly through it. So, um, lights out. I'm reading this book, and it's very interesting because I lived this at GE. 
I lived the the pride, I lived the delusion, and to a certain degree, I was a messenger of both. But I also saw a lot of what was going wrong in the business along, along this whole period. And as a continuous improvement person, as a person who questions things, I was starting to raise my hand in meetings and ask, you know, how can we keep doing this? You know, how can we keep pulling a rabbit out of the hat at the end of every quarter so that we make our number? We are doing so many one-time adjustments, things that aren't sustainable. At what point, you know, does at what point can we quit putting IOUs into our kids' piggy bank is sort of the way I looked at it. We're we're pulling money out of our, our children's savings and putting a, an IOU in there just so that we can, you know, make our car payment this month. That's what it felt like to me. And I was, I was bringing these things up in meetings and kind of getting the hairy eyeball from some executives. And I don't doubt that that may have played a bit of a factor when they were deciding in 2007, who to lay off. And, uh, that I was one of those people. So I'm reading through this book and I'm, I'm reliving a lot of these experiences. Fortunately now with, with some hindsight and more objectivity and less emotional attachment to it. And I hit a point where I'm reading why well, I'd hit a few points throughout the first hundred pages. I'm like page 112 right now, but I hit a point where I, I'd read a few things that sounded awfully lot, an awful lot like things I myself have said. And I thought, oh, okay, this is, you know, maybe just a coincidence. Clearly, I'm very congruent with what was going on. But then I hit a line in the book that felt like an exact quote from me, like an exact quote from me. And it got me thinking, okay, who's the author on this? Thomas Greida. I went to the back of the book and I, I look at the, the picture of him right here. And I'm thinking, okay, the guys, he worked for the Wall Street Journal. I went back into my LinkedIn messages and I saw that in 2018, this guy, Thomas Greida, reached out to me and said, I'd like to interview you about your experiences at GE. And he and I had like a two hour phone call together and uh, off the record though, of course, just because I didn't want to get sued or anything, but sure enough, Thomas Greida, I part, my things I had to say are in this book. So if we hit a point where uh, he, he says something to the effect of what Imelt should have done is like the episode in Seinfeld when um, what's Jason Alexander's character named? Um, someone will get it for me right away. What? What was Jason Alexander's character? George, yes, Costanza. So uh, George Costanza. There was an episode where he realized what he should do is the opposite of whatever his brain tells him to do. And he starts becoming wildly successful. Anyhow, I said, that's what Immelt should have done over his 19 years or, or whatever as chairman and CEO. He should have done the opposite of everything his brain told him to do or just stayed in bed. If he would have just not even gotten out of bed for 18, 19 years, things would have been far better at GE. So if I see either of those two sort of statements within the book, I'll know that came from me. Anyhow, so that was kind of wild. It was kind of a trippy, trippy thing uh, as I was reading last night. And then it just, it dawned on me, wow, I, you know, this guy interviewed me. So that's the book I'm reading right now. I, oops, <clears throat> I just recently finished Breath. I mispronounced it Breathe during my last podcast. It's one of those things, it's one of those words that for whatever reason, unless I'm reading it in context, I always get the two mixed up. I don't know why. But anyhow, just finish this. In the next podcast, I will do a review of it. Uh, on the whole, I liked it. That's the short version. I'll give you the longer version in the podcast. In the meanwhile, 
we are now uh, into the ask me anything phase. And if you already asked me something and I missed it, feel free to ask again. Um, just because I'm not great at scrolling back up through all the comments and then simultaneously answering. Um, what else? Oh, I had um, yesterday, I had a Zoom call with Chris Bear of Keto Chow. And whether you're keto or not, or whether you like Keto Chow or not, Chris Bear is a great guy. And just a super, super nice guy and a total technology whiz. And you can you can really see that if you watch his daily live streams with his wife, Miriam. And I, I asked if he was willing to give me a little coaching so that gradually I can improve my own live streams. And uh, he spent about an hour with me on a Zoom call and taught me a fair amount. But it's going to involve a lot of sort of background work. I had to order, there's this thing called the Stream Deck. It's like an external control panel that then you can set up macros and I can like hit a button and have like another video pop up on the screen. So it, I can, it can basically be almost like a, a newscast where I can pop up windows and I'll, you know, like take me and shrink me down to a corner of the screen. And then my screen share gets big or a video or, you know, whatever, whatever I'm showing. So uh, yeah, Blue Dove, no Courtney today. Initially she had, she had agreed to this last week. And then she told me, well, at 1030, I've got a call with my counselor at school. I hope she's out of bed right now. I went up at 10 to 10 to see if she wanted to come down for the first hour. And she was still in bed, lights out. So hopefully she wakes up in time for the call with her counselor. But um, as I've mentioned earlier, sort of pre-show, I, I, I had kind of expected that Connor and Courtney, after getting used to like four hours of sleep in the Army, would come home and just be up at the crack of dawn. No, nope. Kind of gone right back to that college student sleep in till 11 sort of mode. So no Courtney. Um, what's coming first in the garden? James asked. Well, we have had a ton of zucchini. We are now at the point once zucchini starts in a garden. And I'm a firm believer that only one person per neighborhood needs to have a zucchini plant and you can feed you can feed the world on, on zucchini. So we are going to be in a phase where every night becomes a zucchini night. Despite, we, I mean, we literally, I kid you not, we hit a phase where as people are walking through our neighborhood, even strangers, because they'll see my garden and they'll comment on it because the tomato plants get so big and they're like, wow, that's a great, well, amazing garden. What's all this, this red stuff you've got down and the walkways and all this. And I take that as my cue, as does my wife, to give away produce. We're like, want a zucchini? Here, take one, take two. So zucchini, we also now have enough peppers coming in, or chilies, depending on how you refer to them, um, that I need to do some canning tomorrow. I have an abundance of jalapenos and Hungarian uh, hot wax peppers. I need to get those going. Uh, starting to get some cherry tomatoes as well. So those are really coming in. There are a lot of spaghetti squash going, but from what I'm told, those take a little bit longer to sort of ripen. Uh, moving on. Mike asks, was I a trainer in Crotonville? I was never a trainer in Crotonville. I was Crotonville certified for a number of different courses that, that are taught in Crotonville, but I... I, I never got the trip and I never, you know, never was working there. So do I freeze or can any vegetables or pickles? Tamara asks or Tamara. I'm going to, I'm going to guess Tamara. I don't so much freeze the vegetables. I do can. Um, we, we rip through tomatoes at a pretty vigorous pace, but we're going to hit a point at some point in August where we just can't eat tomatoes fast enough as well. In which case I've got an old style, uh, vegetable mill or whatever you call it, you know, with the crank on it. And through some magical process, it separates out the seeds and skin and just gives you all the good stuff. And, uh, you know, then I'll either, I can bag it and freeze it, or I can make a sauce and I can can it. But mostly, since mostly what I do is peppers and tomatoes, that's sort of the extent of, of what I wind up freezing or canning. 
Uh, I can also then, you know, I, oh yeah, I will take tomatoes oftentimes and dehydrate them and then throw them into a spice grinder to create powder or I'll roast them and then um, put it into a food processor, you know, cause I don't want it totally powder. I kind of want it a little bit flaky and um, you know, put that over eggs or, or use it to, to dress plates, especially if you got something with a nice sauce on it, you know, hollandaise or bernays, and then you sprinkle on the, the tomato powder or flakes. That's pretty cool. So uh, PJ talks about uh, growing peppers with a arrow guide, arrow garden hydroponic system. I've got a smaller arrow garden and we'll use it sometimes for herbs during the winter. The problem is um, one of my cats, Thumper, he, he, it's interesting what he likes to eat. Like he'll go out into my, onto my patio where I've got chives and he'll eat chives. It's, it's weird, but he also likes to mess with any sort of plant. Courtney had some succulents uh, set up in her room and he was like digging them out and things like that. So uh, that can be a bit of a problem. I don't know. Maybe we'll get the, uh, the arrow garden rocking again this autumn. So uh, zucchini bread, Regan, or Rachel asks, I think that's a possibility or zucchini patties of some sort. The thing, I'll prob We're probably going to wind up doing zucchini patties tonight and I'll see how it works with carbulose. I know that's you know, sort of dirty keto, but uh, you know, it's still low carb. We'll give that a whirl. Um. Scrolling back, uh, what are the carbs in a zucchini? CPR Trucking asks. I don't know. It's not high. Um, you know, I don't. Uh, I don't have carb manager handy, but I, I don't think in general, since it's not a, a sweet form of squash, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, scrolling on through the list. So Blue Dove, I, you know, I don't dehydrate a lot of my peppers um, just because most of the time I, I prefer to just jar them. Uh, I like eating pepper slices. To me, that's a snack. I won't even have chips or anything. I'll just open up one of my jars and grab slices of jalapeno and, and eat those. That's, that's one of my keto snacks. Uh, once we hit the end of the season, yeah, I'm going to have some green tomatoes. I'll be doing some, we'll be frying up green tomatoes or pickling them. So we got those coming. Scrolling on through. Um, Tamara says, spiralized zucchini is great. The problem I find is I go out to the garden one day and I see a zucchini and I'm like, ah, that's a little too small. I go out the next day and the thing is like this. Um, I, I, you almost need to ripen zucchini or, or be timing zucchini with the hour hand rather than a calendar. So somebody asked, I, I was scrolling too fast. So in terms of, uh, herbs that do well indoors, um, I, I would generally lean towards stuff that tends to get a little bit more bushy rather than that grows straight up just because, um, yeah, the, my lamp only goes so high on the arrow garden. So I think thyme and oregano are great because those tend to grow, you know, fairly low. But again, you wind up getting these larger leafy uh, green herbs that create a bit of a canopy over the smaller things like the thyme and the oregano. And uh, that can be a problem because, you know, then it's denying them light. All right, scrolling through. So uh, older Pennsylvanian just looked up that chronometer says a cup of zucchini has 4.6 total carbs, one and a half fiber. So Three grams of carbs in a cup, not bad. So, um, John Constabilio, 
dude. Oh my gosh. I knew that you were a uh, uh, Six Sigma guy, like a black belt or master black belt down in uh, Illinois, or like a Black and Decker, I think. Because uh, didn't your dad also work at Black and Decker? Holy cow. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, John Constabilio, John and I were roommates in college. Uh, <laughs> one knock against him is he is a Cubs fan and a Bears fan. But, you know, aside from that, wonderful guy. John, we're going to have to catch up, my man. Um, glad to have you here. So um, that's that's pretty mind-blowing that he, he showed up. So, uh, well... Mike says I'm buffering. I I don't know what to tell you. My my internet speed is pretty super on on this end, and I'm hardwired into the router. So Cynthia asks, can I do an instructional tutorial on various keto thickeners? Um, I plan to at some point. The the thing is, there's there's a lot of them out there, and I've talked with Janie Wang at Modernist Pantry about some of them. And the, the interesting thing is, some of them have really weird interactions with one another. So, I found this with certain starches that you combine them, and and then they jellify. They they quit being a thickener, and they actually become a gelatin. It's it's kind of wild. I found that some work better in cold situations. Some work better, you know, they need heat, like cornstarch needs heat to, to activate. Potato starch needs heat to activate. Xanthan gum doesn't. Uh, some require that you put them into a slurry. Some don't. It's something that I'd like to do as a video, but I know it's going to take a long time to do, both a long time to film and edit, and the video itself is probably going to be fairly long. And I have found that longer videos don't seem to do all that well. Dennis from Black Tie Kitchen and I were having a conversation about this yesterday that, you know, we're debating, do we, you know, because we like the food science and we like to explain what's going on in a video and why certain things happen and why we did this and why we didn't do that, it makes the videos take longer versus doing like one of these uh, tasty style videos or scrump delicious or whatever that other channel is where they're all like three minute long videos. There's, you know, no, no narration. It's just hands and quick cuts and, and all of that. But you do a video like that and then you get to spend all day in the comment section, just answering questions. Well, why did you do this? Could you do this? Could you substitute that? So it's, it's a challenge, you know, I would love to do more of the, the sciencey videos and who knows, maybe that's, maybe that fits better into lean body mind and kitchen hacks. I don't know. So long answer on that. Jason asks fried green tomatoes, Mexican food and jalapenos. Are you sure you aren't Texan? So story here back between my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college, I went to work for a company called the Southwestern Company, which even though it's called the Southwestern Company is actually located somewhere in Tennessee. I can't remember where, if it was Nashville, but uh, what they would do is they would get college students and then you would go door to door selling these things called volume libraries. It was like an encyclopedia condensed down into two books. And while I was down there, you every morning we would get up uh, for, from training and then go to Shoney's for breakfast. And I'd get the buffet and I was doing like grits and biscuits and gravy and I forget what all else, some other Southern staple. And some old guy next to me is like, ah, you're a good old Southern boy, obviously. Uh, and I said, well, I'm from South Dakota, if that counts. But yes, I do. I do. Well, I love I love all sort of ethnicities of food and 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 different variations from the US as well. I mean, I love barbecue and it's interesting uh just how many regional variations of barbecue there are. You know, Kansas City barbecue versus St. Louis barbecue versus Texas barbecue. You know, there's like four different varieties of barbecue just I think in North Carolina. So 
yeah, I love all that stuff. I like all the uh, originals. Jammer or jumper. My wife called you jammer. So another another one of my former roommates just showed up. Jim Harney. Jim, great to see you, man. Um, well, I've got goosebumps right now. This is like a uh, a college reunion for me. Um, so yeah. Um, back back to what I was talking uh, about with with Dennis from Black Tie Kitchen. It's a bit of a conundrum, and I think ultimately what I'm going to do is whatever I want to do. I I think if you let metrics and and Dennis was going through all this analytics stuff. You can go very deep into YouTube analytics and you can, you can like see your audience drop off in a video. And he was showing me his pizza crust video and how like three minutes in, he was down to a 60% retention rate. And by eight minutes in, he was down to like 30% retention. And you know, you, you could just tell how frustrated he was that people weren't sticking through and watching the whole video. But I guess it, so long as they're around for the front part and I get the ad revenue, that's what matters. So I'm going to keep doing what I enjoy doing. And I will mix up some of these shorter form videos with longer stuff. You know, not everything can be a gourmet recipe or a, a science video. Some things, you know, like um, probably tomorrow... I'm going to film another chaffle video because I haven't done a chaffle in a while. And um, I, I, well, actually I did one on my membership live stream that I did yesterday from the kitchen, just experimenting. I, I was kind of a, sort of like a chopped episode. I asked people to, to throw out some ingredients and we tried a couple of different things. And one of the things that I tried was cashew flour. And then I added some uh, stevia sweet drops that were, English toffee. And it was great. It's, it's like, could be my new breakfast sandwich thing as sort of a, not a McGriddle, really a McGriddle bun. But the moment I tasted it, I thought this with a sausage patty in between or some egg and a sausage patty would be pretty delightful. So CPR trucking. Oh, so did I finish my sentence? Which is, I'm just, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. And if, if people like it, they'll watch. If people don't like it, they won't watch. I would rather have people that enjoy my content, watch me and stick with me and be loyal than to try and appease the masses. So uh, CPR Trucking asks, how long is your growing season in Wisconsin? Um, I think you measure it with a clock rather than a calendar. I have had, I've had it freeze on Memorial Day weekend, a hard freeze that has killed off my plants. It's, and that's just heartbreaking, especially when, when you're growing them from seed, starting them in the basement under grow lamps and everything like that, and transplanting them from the little discs up to the, you know, lar larger containers, and then the larger ones, and then the four inch ones. And uh, then it's just heartbreaking. So this year I didn't, I, I didn't grow anything in my basement. I mentioned this in one of my previous podcasts that uh, in the back corner of my basement, I've got both a workout room and a grow room and a Star Wars memorabilia storage area. And that all used to look very, very cool and reflective of me. And now it is nothing but Colton's toys. So, um, so John and Jim, uh, is, in case you didn't know, I'm a grandpa now, and uh, I've got uh, a two and a half year old grandson that lives with us. So I kind of kind of expected that I was going to be an empty nester by this point in my life, and instead now um, we had five adults living in the house and uh, and my grandson. So slightly things don't always go as planned. Uh, so the growing season, back to the growing season, uh, it could freeze as late as Memorial Day and it can freeze in October. So very often I hit, I hit a point in late September, 
early October where it's just, it's a scramble trying to get everything out of the garden before, before a frost, you know, I'll get a frost warning on my phone and it's like, all right, you know, it's time to start picking some peppers and green tomatoes. It's, it's the sort of thing that makes me want to move further South. And, uh, it, that probably will happen at some point. So moving on. All right. Shine or shiny 41 asks, what are your thoughts on the instant pot? And do you have good recipes for it? I love the instant pot. It, um, just because it's so versatile, you get like one of these, uh, eight and one or 10 and one instant pots. I we'll hit a phase where we just start, we'll, we'll be using it every night. We're like, Oh, I wish we would have had this years ago. And then there'll be a phase where we kind of don't. This is the problem with having a cooking channel and a bajillion different appliances is I will, I will quit using one and then I'll go back and I'll use one again. And I'll be like, why, why did I stop using this? I love you instant pot or making the chaffles yesterday. I'm like, wow, I forgot just how incredibly easy these are. And it's fun to experiment. So the instant pot, I think is a great pressure cooker in terms of recipes that I use for it. I think if you get out, there's the, um, cola braised short ribs. You can do a search on that video or go to seriousketo.com and look that up. There's, um, some Tuscan something that I did. I don't know, a Tuscan beef stew, something like that. That's a good instant pot recipe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have more. And one of the things that I kind of need to do with my recipes out on seriousketo.com is put in tags so that people can see, or they can do a search like on instant pot or um, loop and flour or something like that and have it pull up all the recipes. The problem is <clears throat> I don't I really enjoy a lot of the administrative aspects of running a YouTube channel and running a website. I like to just, I like the creative aspects. I, I like the recipe work. I like the cooking, um, kind of like the filming, kind of like the editing, but when it gets into entering the recipe on the website and putting in tags and managing the social media, I've kind of quit to a large extent, even copying any recipes out to the social media platforms just because it becomes one more thing, one more thing where, uh, you know, I need to go out and answer questions or moderate comments or things like that. Okay. Now I got to scroll through here. Um, my, so Rachel says sous vide is amazing. I love sous vide. I got into sous vide and I mentioned this in that review video I did for kitchen boss. I got into sous vide before anybody seemingly knew what sous vide was outside of professional chefs and hardcore foodie geeks. And, um, I, you know, I was sous vide all kinds of stuff. It's one of those things where I think some, some foods lend itself better to, to sous vide than others. The one thing that still weirds me out a little bit is sous vide chicken breast, just because it's, it's so tender that it feels wrong. I'm used to chicken breast that is dry and chewy. So when you have chicken breast that's sous vide and it's fully cooked, it's perfectly safe, but I'm chewing it. I'm like, Ugh, this, this is too tender. Although great then, you know, if you like thin slice it up and, and you put it in some chicken and vegetable soup. Crafty stash, I'm afraid I, okay. I was just gonna say, I didn't understand your question. Mr. Patriot Lawyer asks, you've mentioned Atomic Habits before, wondering how that's helped you in your health journey. Any tips for making exercise a habit? Well, first I'd recommend, I'd recommend the book Atomic Habits. It's a great book. I listened to it on audiobook. And in a way, I kind of wish I had the hard copy. He does anything he references, any cheat sheets, anything like that. He does reference on his website, you go out, you give him your email address, and then you get on his email list, excuse me, and then you can get like all the, you know, the cheat sheets and guides and, and things like that. So I, I, I more recommend that you read that because a lot of the recommendations that he makes in terms of habits are contingent upon where you see your weaknesses in terms of following a habit or what motivates you. 
So in terms of making exercise a habit, it could be something like uh, finding a partner to, to do it with, uh, you know, a spouse, a friend, a child, a parent, whatever, where you say every morning we meet out here at six and we go for a walk. That's one of the things you can do. I think another big thing is, for me at least, is making a, a verbal commitment, making a statement and putting it out there in front of people that you respect or that you want to have looked to you as someone they respect. Because for me, it's very important that I be congruent. I do what I say. I want to have a, as we say in the biz, a high say do ratio. So for me, like when I put out, you know, I'm going to quit biting my nails and I let everybody on my serious keto podcast know that I'm kind of forced to be congruent. Now you watch my cooking videos, you see my hands. I can't, I can't escape these. And I'm happy to say, uh, since February, haven't bit my nails. Now the cuticles still kind of take a beating. Um, I need to be more on top of that, but the nails themselves, they're doing all right. That's a strategy. Uh, can you link exercise to something else, some other thing that is part of your daily ritual. So through sequencing, it becomes automatic. So those are a couple of uh, tips that James Clear gives. He gives a bunch more, but Atomic Habits is a great book. Highly recommend. So scrolling through other sous vide things uh, that you can do. Um, it's very easy to just get into a steak mode because steaks, sous vide, great. Then you do the reverse sear. Generally what I'll do, or at least until I got that sous vide blowtorch of a gun, um, what I would do is I would take cast iron and I'd get it out onto my grill and just let that thing get ripping, ripping hot, like over 700 degrees. The thing was just fantastic. You get an absolutely spectacular crust. But it doesn't, you know, if you got a really thick cut ribeye or filet or something like that, you're not going to get the sides. So, you know, blowtorch handy for that. Plus a blowtorch. I mean, who doesn't want something that can, you know, shoot out a three foot flame? But, oh, anyhow, some of the other things you can do. Um, if you want, you can get like the little mason jelly jars and do the uh, Starbucks sous vide egg bites. You do custards. Um you can do low temperature pasteurization. So I had done a video for Farmer's Almanac on that. I'm afraid to go back and look at it on YouTube just because I felt like it talked too much about sous vide and not enough about canning. And I'm I'm sure there's gonna be some nasty comments about this guy just talks way too much. He's in love with his voice, something like that. But I did a video on low temperature pasteurization and canning and it's out on the, the Farmer's Almanac channel on YouTube. So if you want to see that, if you're interested in doing, uh, the cool thing with that too, is most canners or pressure canners, you can only get so many jars in it. But if you're doing it sous vide, you can take like one of these great big tailgating igloo coolers and, you know, pop your sous vide immersion circulator into it and do a lot more in terms of volume. So that's something you can do and probably something I'll wind up doing for canning at the end of the garden season. So Melissa brings up another helpful tip, you know, having any sort of a, a community helps having an app oh, for exercise, just to let you know what we're talking about. If you've got an app that you can use, and I don't have one to recommend, uh, maybe one of you will. To me, I think getting achievements or badges or trophies, I think that's a great motivator for me anyway, whether I'm, you know, on the Xbox or, uh, YouTube now is doing something where when you hit certain milestones, it gives you a little trophy video or uh, message. Um, I think it was Napoleon that said, uh, a man will fight long and hard for a couple of inches of colored ribbon. It's it's funny, the things, the, the very small things that can motivate us. So CPR Trucking asks, what are my thoughts on alcohol while transitioning into keto? So there are certain alcohols that I guess you could call keto safe. I don't know if I'd call them keto friendly per se, but, um, you know, most hard liquor is zero carbs. 
uh, dry reds and white wines, which I tend to gravitate towards pretty low carb. I probably, I probably have had too much wine, especially during the whole pandemic thing, uh, yet never gone out of ketosis. So it's, to me, it just, it doesn't affect me from a, a ketosis standpoint, but it's still calories. And I think I also tend to eat more when I've been drinking, including wine. It's just it, because to me, the, the two sort of pair and it's like, oh, have a bite of food, have a sip of wine. Well, now I need another bite of food. And I probably tend to snack more than later on in the evening because now I, I feel less inhibited because I've had a little. So I think alcohol is a, it's a, a you need to know yourself and proceed with caution. And I think uh, I could probably credit the, the majority of my quarantine 15 to wine drinking. So I'm actually this, I, I decided that uh, for the duration of this week, I was going to be this week and next week, just, just to see what happens, see how it affects my sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, while I'm camping next week in uh, Northern Wisconsin or Northern is Wisconsin. Plus this week I was going to not drink and just see how it affects me. Like I said, my sleep, my, my mood, my alertness, all of those things. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Thing is, I really, I just, I, I genuinely, genuinely enjoy wine with dinner because to me it's, it's food. It's a pairing. Did, oh, Chris Bear. Boy, we have a celebrity in our midst, Chris Bear. You missed it earlier, Chris. I was saying really nice things about you. So Chris Bear of Keto Chow is here. Uh, he probably just finished his live stream over there. So now he can see how poorly it's done after I just told you what a great job he does. So incidentally, Chris, uh, I didn't tell you in the email that I sent you the... Um, the Stream Deck, I'd gotten out onto Amazon to order the Stream Deck Mark II, and it, it was saying one to two months shipping window. So I got out onto the, um, what was the name, Corsair website, and went to order it directly from them and realized I had ordered the Mark I. So I had to call them up, cancel that order, order the Mark II. Hopefully that'll show up soon. So... Um, Chris says, isn't all of Wisconsin Northern? I've got friends from, uh, the Carolinas that actually think I'm Canadian. So I guess, yes. So Rachel asks, any tips on pulling yourself out of self-pity when dealing with family who eats normally and you start feeling a bit left out? Um, I don't know that I feel self-pity so much as a little bit of resentment. And it's not resentment that they're eating that way. It's resentment that I get so little space in the fridge, in the pantry for, for my keto stuff. And that's, that's for me more the big deal. I've, I can always make something for myself. And what I'll do sometimes when I'm feeling especially irritated with my non-keto family, and they're like, what's for dinner? I'll say, whatever you want, you make it. I'll make my own thing. And maybe we'll get to the point where they're like, wow, we kind of prefer dad's cooking. Maybe maybe we'll eat some keto stuff just to get dad's cooking. So the, the other thing too, they snack a lot. There's never a time, a lot of people have asked me, you know, why, why haven't you done one of those extended fasts again, a 72 or 100 hour fast, you know, that we do as a community. And the reason is, uh, that would, uh, to me, I think it would be very easy to do if I were living by myself. But I have a family that eats constantly. There is never a point when someone isn't making food or eating food in my kitchen, which is another bit of a frustration for me, not just from a, um, like I can't fast because someone's eating, um, but because that's my studio. And that's where I got I to set up my lighting, my camera or cameras. And, you know, they're like, how long are you going to be in the kitchen? I'm like, what? This is, this is how I pay bills or pay a portion of the bills as much as I can doing this. So, um, 
you guys can wait. You, you guys can wait on the kitchen. But uh, I think my strategy, Rachel, is since I say, and I'm trying to say this humbly, I am I am the best cook in the house. At some point, maybe if I just have them making their own food, they will say, Dad, cook us whatever you want. I don't care if it's keto or not, just as long as you're the one cooking it. So, Miriam says, uh, I have to find a way to convert some space in my mudroom for low carb stuff. Yeah, um, I get about 20% of the pantry. So, my storage room, you know, the place where I used to, it used to look kind of like a little mini FAO Schwartz Star Wars section. You know, I had, I had pegboard up on the walls and Star Wars figures, and I kind of had like, uh, shelf set up in aisles and people would come over and I'd let them see the little Star Wars museum. That largely has been pushed into a corner or into storage so that I can have a couple of shelves for my keto ingredients. And the problem is then, since they're downstairs, I'll forget that I have them and I'll be making something upstairs. And I'll be like, oh, I need more uh, silly musk powder. And I order, you know, so I get quick out on the Amazon app and I order it. And then I go downstairs and I'm like, oh, I had a big bag of psyllium husk powder. So I did an inventory. I need to figure out a better visual management system. So if we're talking lean, a better visual inventory management system for my keto stuff that tells me when to reorder and what I have in stock. I've got something like that for everything that I've got in my freezer. So all of my various animal proteins. Uh, scrolling through. So Blue Dove talks about just, you know, making your family make their own food. Yeah, if I were more of a hard guy, maybe I, I would. Uh, Chris says, time to build a kitchen studio. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, the, the problem is I've, I've burnt through about a mu as much of my retirement funds as I can afford to burn through, uh, trying to make serious keto a dream. It's just, that's the reality of it. It's, um, that's one of the reasons why I hope to get this channel monetized fairly rapidly and then make a lot of short form videos, a lot of very quick explainer videos. And, uh, you know, hopefully we get to a point where, um, you know, there's enough income to keep things going. But right now, as much as I would love, I would love to have a kitchen studio, uh, not in the budget. So Miriam asks, what do you have a star Wars museum? Uh, well, what happened, I've been a star Wars fan since childhood and around the time, actually a couple of years before the prequels came out, um, star Wars stuff was really cheap. You know, just there was no interest in it anymore. So I would go to KB Toys or Toys R Us and I'd go to the clearance area and there was always Star Wars stuff, Star Wars figures, etc. on the cheap. So I was I was buying it. And like any sort of obsessive compulsive person, once you start getting into a collector sort of a, a habit, it just explodes. So I have all kinds of stuff. And then episode one came out and I waited I mean, so many stores overbought on that. And I waited till that stuff went on clearance and snagged all of that in sort of a thinking one day, 20 years from now, this will be worth something. Um, hasn't happened. Although my hope is that perhaps, you know, maybe the, the millennials who for them growing up with the prequels, they seem to like those movies more than the original trilogy. Maybe at some point, those folks will start jonesing for some prequel stuff and uh, I'll throw it all out onto eBay or, or something. So Blue Dove asks, have I seen the new smoked salt from Redmond's? If you're talking the Redmond's smoked flake salt, yeah, I've got that. I've had that. That's been out for quite a while. And uh, I've got that fantastic on chocolate ice cream. So take some chocolate keto chow, make some ice cream with it, and then sprinkle on some of the Redmond's smoked flake sea salt. Boosh. All 
All right, continuing to scroll through. This is, I'm starting to hit the point now where having Courtney feed me questions would be great. So hello to everyone who's joined. Uh, PJ Burke talks about loving uh, the air fryer. Yeah, it's just, there are so many cool multi-tools out now. I think the one that I got before the Instant Pot was a combi oven. And I don't think Cuisinart makes it anymore, but it was able to steam and bake and convection bake and um, and then all the marriages of those two, like steam bake or steam broil. And it's super cool. Like to steam broil uh, an entire well, little chicken, like a rotisserie sized chicken, so tender, yet the skin would get super crispy. And now all the air fryers seem to be multifunction and the instant pots or multi cookers. It's, it's super cool. I wish some of these things would have exist, existed 20 years ago. Um, so smokers, people are talking about, uh, oh, Chris asks the smoker I have. So I have a master built electronic smoker, digital I've also got a big black egg, a Kamado Joe, and I used a thing. What was it called? There's there's a little device. It was some again. It was a startup that did it. Prevent of your whatever you've got, whether it's a Weber, whether it's a, a Kamado Joe, big green egg, whatever the thing is. You put it in there. And it controls the speed of the airflow with a fan that's going into your smoker and thus controls your temperature. And that was really cool. It, it To me, smoking, I like to have it be sort of a set it and forget it thing, especially if I'm doing, you know, if you're doing a brisket or uh, a pork shoulder, lots of times that either involves you're putting it in before you go to bed or you're getting up at four in the morning to start the thing, especially if you need to get hardwood, uh, you know, coals going. So I've got that, but then I love, and that's great still for like large jobs, or if I need to smoke two different things at once, but then I got a four tray master built that I use that I like. Um, then indoors, I had bought this little smoke, like stove top smoking tray, and I'll be using that in a video at some point in August. I'm going to do a recipe that I do both indoors on that smoker and outdoors in the master build because I've lots of times when I do a smoking recipe, I'll have people ask what well, I live in an apartment. I do. I can't have a smoker. What can I do? So I will do a little demo of this indoor smoking pan. So scrolling on through, we've got about 10 minutes left right now. It looks like a lot of people sort of chatting it up with each other. Um, Gene Cleo says, you got cramps when starting keto. I can't remember what you said you do about it. It's, um, to me, it's about electrolytes. And I like, I like the tablets or the capsules from Perfect Keto. I used to use sports salts. Um, but then I found out, you know, Perfect Keto, even with just the regular non-sale sort of Steve's serious keto discount, it's 15% off and that became cheaper than sports salts. And then of course, you know, whenever they have their 40% off deals that they tend to have like Memorial day, labor day, sometimes 50% on black Friday. That's when I stock up. Now, if you don't like capsules, I'm going to throw a little shout out here to Chris, which is, um, they've got some liquid keto chow has some liquid drops that you can add. And sometimes I'll throw those into my coffee because they're essentially flavorless. So if, if you're look if you're getting cramps, it's an electrolyte issue and how you choose to take them up to you. So people are asking, have you done PSMF? Yeah, that seems to be sort of a popular thing nowadays, the protein sparing modified fast. No, I haven't done it. I've made, um, um, I'm totally drawing a blank on her name. I've got one of her cookbooks, the woman that, that does that all the time. Um, but I made her bread and actually I didn't make it as a loaf of bread. I, yeah, Maria Emmerich. Thanks, Chris. So instead of making her bread, I decided I would make buns seeing, you know, first, the first test was to see if I could make burger buns. And 
they turn out decently. To me, the texture was a little light. It reminded me almost like of angel food cake. And that's fine if I think you're just doing a little deli meat and cheese or something like that. In fact, it's it's better than fine. It's good. But it didn't strike me as the sort of thing that would hold up to a burger or a bratwurst if I were making hot dog buns. So it's, it's a base recipe I might experiment with. Well, I will experiment with it some more. The question is, you know, how many people want to, you know, do they have a stand mixer? You know, do they have a big KitchenAid where they can whip this stuff up into practically a meringue, um, you know, cause you're whipping egg whites up into, into fairly stiff peaks to make this. And then, you know, you're, you're for, for the, the buns, I'm scooping it into molds. Really. I've got, um, it's sort of interesting tray that at some point I'm going to show in one of my videos. And, but then you're using a spatula trying to, you know, mold these buns to look fairly bun like. So when they come out, they don't look just all warped and everything. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't have I don't have strong feelings on the protein sparing modified fast. So older Pennsylvania says if you dump everything in at the beginning. So you're you're saying dump everything into your kitchen made before you start whipping up the egg. I just I followed her advice, what she did in the video. So you know, I may look at seeing, is there something that I could add, whether it's a resistant starch that might hold up in baking or something like that, that, um, that will, that will give the, the bun maybe a little bit more elasticity, make it a little bit less like angel food cake. But, um, I, I see, I see people kind of go in places with that recipe of, of Maria's. All right, if I missed any questions along the line, we've got five minutes left if anybody wants to ask anything. Uh, I don't know what else I've got to, to cover here. I'm sort of like looking around. I don't want to give away like content from my next podcast. Have people uh, tune into that. Hey, Chicken Barm, welcome. Um, so... Tam says zucchini chaffle. Yeah, I think I think it, it might be interesting to see what happens, whether it's in the waffle maker or whether it's in the dash mini griddle. That might be that might be a better answer for a zucchini patty, but I will have no shortage of zucchini here in the coming weeks to experiment with. So expect to start seeing a lot of stuff from my garden, whether it's herbs or vegetables showing up in some videos. Um, where is Aaron Rodgers going? I don't know. I don't know. I'm sitting here, uh, in my office. I'm looking up. I've got, uh, there, I got an autographed, uh, canvas with him and, uh, and the rest of, uh, his receiving core from the, the year that they won the Super Bowl. Um, I've got, I've got some stuff out there in the general man cave of his. There could be a lot of stuff coming off the wall. In, uh, in, a, in a few weeks, we'll see. Or maybe everything works out, but yeah, that's a frustrating situation. So Michelle said uh, she added coconut flour to the, uh, the protein modified or protein sparing modified fasting bread and it deflated. So good info. Tam asks, any plan on filming in the park in the fall? I I plan on doing some filming outside, more filming outside in general. A, a lot just depends on the weather. And the problem, the big problem seems to be around here, wind. You know, I'll, there have been some days where I've set up outside and it's like, oh, it's nice and still and great. This is just perfect. It's not too sunny. I'm going to get a great video here. And by the time I've got the camera out and the microphone on, there's enough wind coming that I'm like, Pfft all right, this is going to get totally picked up by the mic. There's nothing I can do about it. Time to go inside. So um, it doesn't, all, Chris asks, doesn't always rain whenever you go outside with the camera. No, but wind, definitely. You see, because the rain then would be good for the garden. If I had that sort of power, you know, to water my garden, I could just go outside with the camera whenever it needs watering. 
and uh, boom, done. But no, it's wind, which leads me to believe if I then broke out a kite, I could probably get the wind to stop. I'll have to try that. The next time I have a video, I'll just pretend like I'm going out to fly a kite. The wind will stop and then I can record a video outside. So I think then I'm going to wrap, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to wrap this up because um, I started uh, about 10 minutes early and um, hopefully we can get Courtney in on one of these. She's going to be in a lot of the serious keto videos. Let me just quick pop over, tell you how many we've recorded that are already uploaded and just sitting in the waiting for release category. So we just released our video was it yesterday on Chalk Zero. So we got one, two cooking videos in the hopper. Um, another review video for sure already recorded. And then uh, let me get back to the right window here. Hang on. Sorry about this. And then uh, we've started filming her tasting some of the keto chow flavors. So um, that'll be exciting, for, especially for Chris and Miriam. They can see what uh, another non-keto member of my family thinks of their products. So Janet says, my wife is a great guest too. She's kind of camera shy though. She's uh, kind of uncertain, you know, doesn't always know to, to look at the camera. She, she just, she feels a little bit uncomfortable on camera. Uh, and I had one, I had one commenter accuse me of being a wife beater because of the way that Terry looked on camera, that, that it seemed like she didn't want to even be next to me. That's not true. I'm not a wife beater. I adore my wife. So, um, I think that's going to be it. And, uh, I, I'm so glad that all of you could enjoy or I'm, I'm assuming enjoy this podcast, but at least join me for this podcast. And John and Jim, if you're still watching, uh, great to, well, I can't actually see you. I can pretend like I'm seeing you. Great to see you guys again. And uh, we should uh, we should chat again at some point. So everybody take care and uh, we'll see you soon.